Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And aloha. Welcome to another edition of Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin, and uh, thank you for joining us again. For those of you who may not have seen the program before, uh, here we talk about, of course, military veterans issues and try to keep you updated on what's happening past, present, and possibly what's happening in the future. Uh, today, uh, my guest is Mr. Dennis Ige, who's been on the program before. Dennis, thanks for coming in. And um, again, uh, just to recap, for those who may not have seen you or known of you, which I can't imagine who out there hasn't doesn't know about you, <laughs> but uh, a little bit of background about yourself. I know you're an activist and all that good stuff. Yeah. Right? Well, thank you for having me, Kelvin. Yeah. Well, huh, this all began a long time ago, and uh, uh, ba basically, you increased my my thoughts about activism by mm -hmm. allowing me to share your thoughts on the air with your studio audiences. So. I'm, I'm totally turned on now until I get too old to do this. Hopefully that won't happen no. very soon. Most, uh, I started out here, uh, I am the chapter president for the National Association for Uniformed Services, which is soon to become the Uniformed Services Association. Mm -hmm. They re-identified themselves. And uh, we are a voice in, on Capitol Hill in Congress through the National uh, Military Veterans Alliance. And that's a, that's a umbrella group. There's two of them, and this is the other one. Mm -hmm. uh, so single purpose, multi-purpose veteran service organizations, not necessarily uh, agreeing with the largest ones, mm -hmm. but we, we get our job done, and uh, uh, we do our best to just keep, keep going, yeah. because we have to. <coughs> Yeah, the thing is with all the different organizations out there that have the National Alliance or the Coalition for the different groups that go That's what the coalition does. So, yeah. the, the groups, the member groups are, are invited and they become delegates. Mm -hmm. And so now we have, rather than just one organization and its members making the decisions of where they want to go with the, with the Congress members who are elected to represent their interests, mm -hmm. keep them interested in doing that. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. So uh, after we make our decisions at our at our meetings and we focus on those things, then all the member organizations, they follow up with their favorite members of Congress. Yeah. Um, I know that you go back to Washington frequently and do you travel around the country. As far as as a whole, uh, what is your take? How are, are the organizations really effective when they go up and talk to these people in the Capitol, you know, in, the, in Washington about um, the different um, concerns of the active and veteran community? I'm not sure about that, but I, but I know, but I know I am. Uh, I was. <laughs> I noticed that uh, that uh, there is a movement in the administration to try to modernize the VA to better serve the veterans. Yeah. And it seems like the veteran service organizations are totally opposed to that. Mm -hmm. uh, once we find out who's really running the VA, yeah. making it function the way it does, mm -hmm. then maybe we'll, we'll finally get around to modernizing it. Uh, the latest situation, uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth, who everybody knows, uh, got the rules of Congress changed so that she could bring her baby in, in with her to Congress. And uh, she's, a, she's a Gulf War veteran who, who lost some limbs in a helicopter accident in that war. I had a conversation with her when she was still working for the VA, which is just a short walk yeah. from the White House. And the issue was consolidation of veterans' uh, health care record keeping with the Pentagon where all of the veterans come from mm -hmm. uh, to the VA. Well, at that time, uh, former President Obama had, had uh, got the two secretaries to shake hands on the idea. So now the idea has been turned on its head and the VA is being encouraged to abandon its VISTA record keeping program, software program, in favor of the Pentagon's or something there too. And what that does for the VA since uh, our healthcare industry uses this program that the VA adopted, uh, they're going to be out in the dark even more. So, it, 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 in terms of 
consolidating serv healthcare services with our healthcare industry and the VA. Uh, maybe it's a step backwards, but it seems like all the major the veterans uh, service organizations are in favor of this step backwards. So, uh, like I say, I believe we have to first discover who's running the VA, yeah. and, and then it's obviously not the secretary. So you get, it seems like they get fired every year. Yeah, well, could you, so, <coughs> with, you know, with the VA, oh, well, one quick question. You mentioned that um, Duckworth was going to be able to bring her baby into the sessions. She did. So now she gets two votes instead of one, or what? No, no, no. The baby's just there as an observer. Okay, God. That's just a rule. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back to the radio days, Calvin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. As far as with the VA, anyhow, I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the past before, we both, uh, you know, commented on it. There are a lot of people out there in the VA that work hard and try to do what they can, based on the information that they're, you know, have to work with. Yeah. But still in all, like say, it seems like time and time again, we have the same things that go on where we either got a position, we got something in place that works, and then they want to go ahead and change it and mm -hmm. bring in a new system or whatever. And again, it's musical chairs where what is what's going on, you know? And the bottom line is how it's effective the, affecting the veterans and their families, you know? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, I mean, we're at that point where, you know, the frustration builds in, you know, and that's why, you know, we get there's so many things, issues that go on where, you know, hell, I mean, we talked about in the past, suicide rates, things of that nature. Uh, also with the um, the way things are happening with the families, you know, where, again, with the frustration sets in, when you're trying to get part of the system, get something that you earned, and then you turn around and you got a, you know, a song and dance about why they can't give it to you, and then when you do get it, either you're under, uh, you're under, you're underappreciated, I'll put it to you, that, right, you know, in a monetary right. sense, anyhow, you know, for something that you earn. And this comes back to, you know, affect the families because if they're not getting the benefits that they're entitled to, especially like health mm -hmm. benefits, things of that nature, then it turns around and comes out of pocket for the families, you know. And right. that's why, you know, you and I, you know, we talk offline a lot about what's going on, the frustrations, you know, that we hear out there, mm -hmm. you know. And again, not to be negative about it, but again, you know, we just, you know, over and over again, and you hear some of the horror stories, there's a lot of people that are being taken care of, okay? But there are a lot of people out there who are not being adequately handled in, in a, you know, in certain areas, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, the frustration um, with the, the, we'll say the systemic problems that mm -hmm. need to be corrected, you know? So that's the way I see it. Well, we, we do know that all of us have contributed <coughs> at least 40 quarters. Yeah. We do have a Medicare card and a Social Security card. Neither one of those cards has our photo ID on it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's proof of health care insurance, a Medicare card. Mm -hmm. Now, the VA's uh, photo ID that identifies uh, those of us veterans who are enrolled in their health care system, uh, we have a photo ID card that here locally it's not accepted, or it's not going to be accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, the 1st of June, and my last trip to Washington, D.C., I surprised, I didn't surprise our U.S. Senators that this was going on out here, mm -hmm. and they promised to do something about that. Well, it seems like uh, they were instrumental in getting the uh, effective d date of the changeover where veterans who do not have the Army-issued ID uh, will not be allowed on campus. That's been set back till October. Yeah. Now, hopefully, uh, the next thing that'll be done, it'll be set back to next year, and then maybe forgotten about. Is this the cap card you were talking about, or? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the cap, everybody's, all the veterans who don't have a, a DD Form 2, mm -hmm. uh, they won't be allowed on campus at Tripler unless they have an Army-issued ID that's acceptable at the gate. Yeah. So uh, for, for, for them, uh, forget about Matsunaga Clinic, right? Yeah. Now, we do have another uh, stealth CBOC out on uh, Fort Weaver Road, co-located with Queens Hospital. Yeah. For those who may not be familiar with the term CBOC, could you oh, explain uh, that to them? Community-based outpatient center. Mm -hmm. And they're located on the fifth floor at the Queens West Medical Clinic yeah. on Fort Weaver Road. Mm -hmm. However, you won't know this unless you watch this program and heard me tell you that, yeah. because there's no sign. Now, uh, 
when I asked when I asked the VA what's up with that, they said, "Well, we're only renting." And I said, "Yeah, you're renting from St. Francis Hospital." Yeah. So I called St. Francis <coughs> Hospital. I said, "You know, would it be appropriate for the VA to put a sign out on the street so the veterans driving by say, "Oh, there's a Seabock. Well, I can go there and be treated. It's right in my neighborhood." And wrong answer. They're not accepting anybody who they didn't already sign up. Yeah. And how long has the Seabock been out there? Uh, probably as long as uh, Queens has been out there, three, four, five years. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, they're on the fifth floor, hidden away. Uh, the gate guard, he'll, he'll let you know yeah. that it's out there, and you just keep driving until you see the sign and you go in the parking lot. And they're on the fifth floor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe they're claiming they, they're understaffed or they don't have space. See. But uh, the whole fourth floor is being renovated, mm -hmm. and if they'd have been a little bit more thoughtful, they might have rented, you know, decided they want to rent the fourth floor, too. Yeah, but see, that's what gets to me. Turn around, it's just like, you know, plausible deniability. I mean, they turn around, they say, well, what do you have in place for the veterans? You know, it's like, okay, well, we got this. All right, do they know about it, you know? No. Is there anything out there, like, say, that indicates, like, say, that these services are there for, I mean, that the, where the location is, right. you know? And it's like, uh, the, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, again, they turn around, they, you know, you ask about something, they say, oh, we got it, but we're not going to tell you where it is, you know, or how right. to get it. Yeah. You know? Or you can't get there. Yeah. They won't, they won't enroll anybody new. If you live in Eva and you were formally treated at uh, Matsunaga on, on the Tripler campus, yeah. and you can't go there anymore because you don't have the proper ID, <clears throat> uh, they won't treat you at the other one either. But yeah. you could go into the Queen's Hospital uh, emergency room and they'll take care of you and they notify the VA up on the fifth floor. Oh, by the way, we, we had a veteran had to come into our emergency last night. Just thought you'd like to know. Yeah, well, like I say, you begin to wonder, like I say, what exactly is going on um, as far as with the, it's like a shell game, you know, where, you know, they, where's the P at? You know, where are my benefits? Yeah. How do I get them? And all that, you know. And again, it's just the frustration you hear so much with our elected officials and even with a lot of the organizations, how much they care yeah. about the veterans. And then you turn around, when you do hear these, you know, horror stories or, you know, the, the situations out there that are pretty frequent, you know, right. then you begin to wonder, like, say, do they really care? You know, and again, it, with me, it's like a level, I try to maintain as far as commenting on the VA because of my personal, um, some of my personal experiences with them, you know? Right. So I don't want to, you know, color, I mean, just present the facts of what's happening here, right. you know? But I do, can, I can relate to the frustration, you know, and the anger in a lot of cases mm -hmm. about uh, how they're being treated anyhow, you know, because you just hear a lot of times it's lip service. I mean, there are, like say, good programs out there, mm -hmm. but like say, for those falling through the cracks, I mean, that the ones are out there when you you're, when you're personalize it and you have somebody out there, like, and a lot of times it could be a case of life and death, literally, you know, mm -hmm. and when they're not being adequately uh, taken care of, I mean, I mean, we hear it. I mean, you know, off, you know, offline we hear about these stories, right. you know, and a lot of things, like say, are not brought to the public's attention, and that's what, you know, I think needs to be done. You know, not the blame game or anything like that, but just to make sure, like say, that the accountability, these people are held accountable. You know, and that's what again my frustration gets sometimes when I hear these things and, you know, and see firsthand what's happening. Right. You know? Well, actually, I think right now mm -hmm. they're holding themselves accountable. Well, now, we do have, we do have supposedly mm -hmm. an advocate here, the State Office of Veteran Services. Yeah. And uh, they're supposed to be our advocate. Uh, they meet with us uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, at the Oahu Veterans Council, and every county has a Veterans Council. I think on, on the Big Island, they have two of them. Okay. But uh, in, fa in fact, the State Office of Veteran Services, they publish a, a nice newsletter yeah. for us to read about what's going on statewide. Right. Uh, viewers digest that information. We're going to take a short break and then we'll come back and continue our conversation Roger that. here on Hawaii in uniform. Thank you. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. 
Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Okay, you're back with Hawaiian uniform. And again, my host, I mean, <laughs> God, I keep getting that mixed up. My guest is Dennis Ige, anyhow. Right. Okay, before we took the break, we thought you were talking about the uh, uh, the veteran services or whatever and council and everything else. What exactly do they do? I mean, I'm familiar with it, but in your own words, tell me, uh, you know, explain to the audience exactly what they do or supposed to do. Oh, the, the C box? No, no, the council. Oh, the council. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they have delegates from the local, uh, each county has uh, veteran service organizations uh, representing the interests of their members. And they sit as delegates at this council. And in fact, uh, even uh, the advisors sit as delegates. Uh, the, the Veterans Administration, State Office of Veteran Services, uh, Senator Hirono sends a representative from time to time. Mm -hmm. And then there are other various and Sunday people come in. Uh, some of them host, uh, we have a PTSD rehab retreat graduation yeah. lunch where we, uh, we recognize the efforts that the PTSD veterans have put in to try to, to get comfortable with their their disorders, right? Okay, let's talk about that real briefly anyhow. The PTSD, okay, um, I've been to several of the meetings anyhow for the graduates, and these are people, some of them have been out of the service for quite some time before mm -hmm. they get into the program. So if there's any viewers out there, like say you went through or, you know, have been diagnosed with PTSD, uh, get in touch with the, you know, uh, the VA for the, pro, you know, to get enrolled in the program, and uh, it's never too late to try to go ahead and you know, do something that's going to help you to correct. Help you, you know, help yourself. Help you help yourself, and yeah, yeah. But uh, it takes, you know, a lot of courage, you know, like I mentioned uh, before. Uh, you know, going into combat, taking orders, that's one thing, you know, where you have to do what you got to do. But when you get out and you recognize that you do have a problem, you know, and it's affecting you, the community, and everything else, and you decide to go ahead and step up to the plate and say, okay, I need help. I need to get into some sort of program, mm -hmm. you know. And it takes a lot more courage to do that sometimes than it does to go into combat, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, those individuals I've seen who graduated from the uh, program, I mean, it's a major change in their life, you know. And I'd like to say, there are programs out there that are beneficial, and, you know. Sure. So it's not knocking everything about the VA. No. But the thing is to make sure, like say, if there's any programs that are helpful, that they either need to be expanded upon, or at least the public needs to know, or the veterans and the military community need to know what's out there, how they can access it, so they can take full you know, advantage of it. You know, mm -hmm. so that's what I see. Well, this is true. <clears throat> I remember my grandfather, my grandmother told me once that uh, to her mind, when she observed Civil War veterans mm -hmm. sitting around outside the bars, she said, boy, those were just some grumpy old men. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who have been in combat, <laughs> we understand why. But in those days, they didn't understand the yeah. trauma, how the trauma expect, affects the brain. And, yeah. and it, provide, it just comes up with a mental disorder. And uh, I have a couple of friends, one guy, I mean, he asked me the other, just the other day, he said, am I hard to get along with? I said, we've both been in the military. We meet so many diverse personalities through that experience. Yeah. He said, for, for me, I've just learned to stay away from the places you don't like to go. And there's plenty of other things that we can enjoy together without me having to pick on you on the, in these areas that, uh, or could be trauma related, we don't know. And yeah. he was happy with that answer. Yeah. Well, as far as these distance, different syndromes, I'll touch on this real quick anyhow. They got so many different syndromes now, like say, that you could be diagnosed with. Because uh, mm -hmm. one example that one gentleman I ran into, he was discharged because he had immature personality development. Yeah. What and he joke. did like four combat tours. Yeah. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden now, it's like, eh, we find that you're too immature for the military, so therefore, you know, thank you, but bye-bye. You know, yeah. you're out of here, mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of these different uh, syndromes that they come up with, you gotta find out, um, you know, what, what's behind it, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially when it's costing the veterans as far as their, um, their benefits, what they need to, you know, to do. And right. I think that's not being adequately addressed, you know, when you have somebody that's been in for quite some time 
and then all of a sudden you're summarily dismissed, you know, where do you go through? Now it becomes a burden on the society or as far as the local communities because if they're not being treated at the VA or other uh, federal levels, then it is going to come back, like say for the taxpayers at the local level, to mm -hmm. go ahead and pick up on it, you know? Right. So that's what I see. And I think, uh, again, I hear a lot of frustration with a lot of veterans out there who have been dismissed. You know, after doing their job, uh, you know, serving their country, and then come to find out because of some disorder, you know, that now you are not entitled to what you thought you were, you know, that you were going to get, you know. So all your time and sacrifice, that's where the frustration builds up also, you know. Well, Tabby told me in our discussion <coughs> years ago, maybe eight years, I don't remember how many years, but uh, your B VA benefits start the moment you're sworn in. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. Others you earn through experience. You experience something in the military and another benefit kicks in. People who really know how to work the system in the VA, mm -hmm. they do quite well. But so <coughs> few people really know how and then they they don't Apparently, they don't get the help they need when they ask questions. Yeah, well, that's another thing, though. Like, say, you and I, again, you know, we've been around for a long time, talked to a lot of people, hear a lot of things out there, in, you know, in the field and everything else. Mm. And the one thing, you know, that uh, one of the dirty little secrets that's out there, you know, and maybe have some a little bit of validity to it, that, you know, sometimes it's who you know in the system that helps you to get what you, you know, what your final, uh, the out final outcome is, you know. And if that feeling is out there and floating around, you know, then again, that that adds to the the frustration and the, the different you know, anxieties. You know, mm -hmm. when you feel that you you know that you have to know somebody to get what you've earned. You know, right. and then you know that gets back to the council. What do they do? You because I, I frequent the place quite free. I mean, quite yeah. often anyhow. You know, and is the message getting out? Is the council really being effective? I mean, I got dedicated people that attend the council, but as far as a cohesive type of um, effort within these different organizations mm -hmm. to disseminate that information because a lot of them, they get out there and they get the information and it's like, okay, well, this is just for my members, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not going to tell anybody else, you know? So when you have that and you have the grassroots, you know, people out there, close to, what, 120,000, give or take, um, you know, veterans here in the state of Hawaii at any given time. Mm -hmm. You have 30,000 Vietnam veterans here, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, like, say, how are they getting the word? Is it getting out there? And I mean, I know there's a lot of different programs, hopefully, like, say, that are mm -hmm. disseminating that information, but apparently there's still a shortcoming as far as how it's being spread, you know? You really have to know somebody before you're going to get the help that you need or the benefits that you've earned. Right. Well, good numbers, 130,000 vets, huh? Let's Roughly. presume there's one in every household. Okay. 130 households got a one vet in it, only one. Yeah. There's only 400,000 households in the whole state. Mm. So you can still walk out and pick up your newspaper in the morning and you can look across the street and probably two of those houses across the street that you, you are in your line of sight that early in the morning, there's probably a veteran in there. Yeah. So we are, in fact, have the largest per capita community of veterans at anywhere in the nation. Mm -hmm. Now, California obviously has, statistically speaking, they have 10% of the veterans yeah. living in their state because they got 10% of the country's population. Yeah. But they don't match us. So we have an awful lot of veterans here. I think at the grassroots level, the people who are providing the services they're doing a pretty good, pretty darn good job. Uh, I've gotten two or three or four people yeah. to sign up. They were very reluctant, mm -hmm. and now they're happy, and they have their ID cards. Yeah. Uh, and, and they'll be good anywhere except that mom. What that ID card needs to be transformed into is exactly what the Medicare card is, proof of insurance. Mm -hmm. So you're a veteran with this card. This is another form of insurance provided you in in recognition of your service to your country, selfless service. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of things that definitely still need to be addressed anyhow. And again, not knocking those individuals who, you know, are in the system, but systemically. And then it goes back to Washington. You know, like mm -hmm. say those are the ones who set the tone and the tenor for, you know, what trickles down anyhow, you know. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, we still have to, you know, keep fighting it. But uh, you know, as long as I've been around, you know, for, for quite some time here and it's always the same, seems to be the same thing about certain uh, issues about the hospital. We don't have a veterans hospital here. No, you know? that's why we all got choice cards. Right. And the thing, you know, and before I, I understand that the money was allocated, like say more than a decade ago, but what happened with that, you know? Right. And why wasn't there a follow-up, you know? 
And again, you know, you're holding certain people accountable who profess to be looking out for the veterans. You know, and I don't want to keep beating that same drum, you know, but the thing is, there are people out there who are in positions of responsibility then that should get out there, get up off their hind legs and whatever they were sitting on and do what needs to be done, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think that it also takes, like say, an effort on the veterans themselves to go ahead and start raising a little bit of help. I mean, start, make the phone calls. Find out, like say, who's in charge of these different committees. Mm -hmm. Like say, that how affecting, you know, that have an effect on your life, you know? So again, it's not all doom and gloom, but we need to go ahead, like say, and make sure Again, that these people are that the system is being corrected, you know, as fast as possible, mm. you know. So, um, I tell you, before we get into anything else, I don't want to keep beating on <laughs> on a positive note here. On the uh, 9th of June, there's going to be a uh, hearing law solution for veterans. This is uh, something that I believe is sponsored by the VA. It's going to be at the Oahu Veterans Center, and um, that's down at uh, 1298 uh, Kukila Street, uh, down in Foster Village. So it is a good program if you have problems. Uh, they provide, um, they'll tell you how to get uh, free um, or no cost uh, equipment if you do have a hearing problem when you're, you know, of course, on the phone or whatever. So they'll give you instructions. But if you want any more information about that, you can call 422-4000 and talk to Claire. She's down at the, she's the executive director for the uh, Oahu Veterans Center. There's a difference between the center and the council. But uh, they do have, uh, they're starting to pick up on some programs that I believe are beneficial, you know. So if you're a veteran or dependent or just uh, this open to the public, go down and find out what's going on. You may be able to do something that will help to benefit um, a veteran in your community or at least, um, you know, try to alleviate some of the stress on the, um, you know, on the taxpayers anyhow. So by getting the word out there. But uh, there's going to be a council meeting. This Saturday, tomorrow, the, 9 uh, o'clock tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, o'clock. come on out. Every okay. veteran is, is welcome by definition. Good. Dennis, we're down to the wire. Anyhow, any last things in 30 seconds or less? Nope. I've, I've been having a great time. <laughs> uh, and if it gets any better, I'll, I'll buy into that, too. Okay. And Anyhow, thank you for having me on board today. Yeah, as I mentioned before, like I said, we try to be positive about what's happening here as far as the information. And sometimes the, uh, the frustration you may detect that in my voice is not out of anger. It's just out of concern for a lot of people that's out there that can't be here to speak for themselves anyhow. So we, that's what I know you try to do. I try to do it. There's other people out there, unsung heroes that do the same thing. But anyhow, thank you for tuning into the program again. And um, God bless. And until that time.